Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Andrew Rowe and I'm currently a cloud security engineer working and living in Boulder, Colorado. Now my videos are kind of geared towards helping people integrate themselves into what they can expect when they join the field of cybersecurity or software engineering or technology in general. But I don't really give a lot of insight to what I actually do for my actual profession. Uh, again, I'm a cloud security engineer. I've been one for about three years now and I came over from a kind of a software engineering role. And I really think that whether you want to go into my exact specialization or you want to become an analyst or you want to become, you know, an infrastructure engineer, any of these kind of things, that you can really learn a lot from, you know, my kind of journey and what my day-to-day -day responsibilities are. And you can, you know, check some things off of your list and, and actually see if this is a job that you could want. Um, so without further ado, today I'm going to be showing and telling you guys what I actually do in my day-to-day -day as a cloud security engineer. <laughs> So, as I told you guys before, I've been a cloud security engineer for about three years now. And my day-to-day -day responsibilities vary pretty greatly, um, especially coming over from a small startup. Well, it wasn't exactly a small startup. It was a startup of about 300 people, but it was a very fast-moving startup. Um, and now I work for a government contracting company where we work with big government clients as well as you know federal and, and state um, regulators. So, my day-to-day -day now is actually a lot different than it was before. But now what I do on most days, and again, this is more of a generalization in terms of what I do. Some days it's different, some days it's not. Some days I have to do policy and document work. I hate that kind of work, but it has to be done and I still learn a lot from it. But on most days, what my job is going to be is taking high level requirements that I get from you know government CISOs, managers, or my own project managers, and trying to create solutions with them. Now, what does that mean? I know you guys have probably heard that a bunch of times and it, it sounds even more vague when you say it uh, more often. Um, so I'm really gonna try to help explain what that actually is and what you would be doing if you got a job that's the same as mine. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I could get you know a list of requirements coming down from a client that's going to ask me, uh, hey, we're aligning ourselves against you know FedRAMP moderate. We're aligning ourselves against NIST CSF. We're aligning ourselves against NIST 853. Those are all different frameworks that as a cybersecurity professional or engineer, you're gonna have to know in order to get your first job and also to you know be really, really sharp in terms of aligning yourself against frameworks and being compliant. So when a client comes down with a list of requirements that they need or a list of controls from a framework that they need covered, they usually give me a vague list where it's like, hey, we need monitoring and logging on this. We need to um, have an extra password policy on this. We need to make sure that we have a fail safe or a data monitoring um, solution in place so we can go back and get a system of record of all the you know, API calls that are happening in our cloud infrastructure, any of those kinds of things. So to give you guys an example, one of my latest projects was I had to create a configuration management system. Now what that is is, all it does is go through and check based on a list of you know rules that I give it uh, if configurations are compliant. Now that checks if the password policy is as complex as we need it to be or as the client wants it to be. Checks if we have monitoring and logging with CloudTrail logs, CloudWatch events, um, and it checks that they're all being you know logged to a database or an S3 bucket or anything like that. And there's about 20 different rules that I actually created for this solution. And every single one gets logged on a daily basis, gets sent to a database, and the client you know, can pull the records of that, uh, of that log to see you know, kind of a system of record what's actually happened in their infrastructure. Now as a cloud security engineer, my job is to actually take those requirements, like I said, and the requirements that I got were we need to just manage configuration. And I had to come up with this solution. So my job was to not only research that solution, but conduct cost analysis on that solution as well. Because even though you're just an engineer, a client, especially when you're in a client facing business like I am right now, a client's not gonna wanna pay a ton of money for the next you know, greatest, coolest solution that you can think of, although that would be great as an engineer to be able to do that. The client is really gonna wanna stay cost effective, right? So it's gonna be your job to not only research the solution, but also do a bit of cost analysis to see if the solution is good compared to others, or if you could, you know, take away a little bit of functionality in the actual code or the cool part that us engineers like to do to save a little bit of money. That's also going to be part of your job. Now, in terms of the actual solution that I created and solutions I've created in the past, they all have, you know, some of the same kind of technology that I would be using. I'm always using the AWS CDKs, you guys see, 
in my past videos. It's one of the, the best technologies that I've actually learned. Uh, I'm also using SDKs uh, from AWS itself, uh, the AWS Python libraries, such as like Voto3 or the APIs. And all of these things come together in creating comprehensive solutions, whether it's through you know, the CDK and the actual infrastructure roles that I'm creating or the infrastructure itself, or lambdas that are actioning on pre-existing or infrastructure that I'm creating my, on my own. All of this has to do with cloud native tooling and things like Ansible and Puppet and Chef and things like that, that you can take CloudFormation and you can deploy it across a wide range of accounts. Now, this might seem like a repetitive theme in my channel, talking about you know automation, CDK, all these kinds of things, but think of it as you know kind of like a technology agnostic channel or a technology agnostic um, theme because automation is what clients actually want. So in my role, again, as a cloud security engineer, you're gonna have to do a lot of automation. Clients want to take away those manual hours of having to pay people for operational work and they wanna pay you upfront, you know, not technically me, but the company I work for upfront to create a comprehensive solution that's gonna do that repeatable task over and over and over again. Now the thought process behind that is you're gonna pay more at first because you're paying highly skilled knowledge workers to create solutions. Um, but in the long run, you're gonna not have to pay, you know, an operational worker to complete those tasks on a daily basis because the automation is gonna take care of it for you. So a large theme of what I actually do is using infrastructure as code like I always talk about. So CDK, Terraform, all these kinds of things. But some skills that I think you should have in order to get a job and, and do kind of what I do if you want to, is you really have to be able to critically think and, and research this kind of tooling very, very well. Because people are gonna expect you not only to know the kind of tooling that you're bringing up and proposing for these solutions, but they're gonna expect you to know how much it costs. And trust me, I've made mistakes in the past where I you know, conjure up these amazing solutions and little do I know they're gonna cost $800 a month in a small account and that's never fun. So if I was to give you guys another example of you know, kind of a solution that I've created in the past and, and one that you guys can you know, try to research yourselves and focus on, sorry, that was my dog research yourselves and focus on. So if you want to get a job as a cloud security engineer, you can kind of have a leg up on the competition. Another one that I created was in cloud accounts, you're always going to have access keys, right? You're gonna have an access key, secret access key, and that's going to be kind of the identity management system. It's the same thing as a username and a password. People protect them with their lives. Um, and it really gets you access to everything in the cloud or anything that's connected to the cloud. So access keys are a huge part of security and a huge part of just DevOps and, and working in the cloud in general. So as a security professional, you're going to want to put requirements on those specific access keys, whereas you don't want someone to have an access key over 90 days because then it's just too long to have an access key. That's essentially like having a password for 90 days and not changing it. That's just bad practice. So if you have an access key over 90 days, I created this Slack bot that actually prompts you to change your access key um, by authenticating to AWS from Slack. So something that's really cool is, you know, this was more of a startup, so it's a lot more versatile and agile, but the solution itself is actually creating a Slack bot that says, hey, your access key is about to expire in five days. Why don't you log in and change it? Here's the link. Now that might seem dumb at first, right? But security is always seen as an abrasive, you know, restrictive team. So if you actually interact with people in a fun way, and we actually had this cute little robot picture as the actual Slack bot itself, so when it prompted people to, to interact with it, it was, it was kind of fun, it was cool. Um, so security is always seen as this restrictive thing. So if you kind of bridge the gap a little bit and say, hey, you know, th this is my job, I wanna do it, this is gonna keep us safe, but here's a fun way and an easy way in which you can you know, help me out. That's where automation comes in. That's where operational tasks are gonna have to take a back seat. That's why these companies are gonna pay you to automate in the way that I've been automating. So those are just some of the basic solutions that I've created in the past. I've created many more other than that. If you wanna to talk to me about those or ask any questions about them, feel free to DM me on Twitter or join the Discord or whatever you wanna do. So that's kind of my job at a high level, right? I take requirements given by clients, I research and create solutions based on those requirements, and I kind of do a bit of maintenance on the solution itself because you know code bases have a bit of upkeep to them. I don't really want to tell you guys what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, day -day basis and not really tell you some skills that you can get in order to actually become a cloud security engineer or a security engineer if you want to become one. So one thing that is really daunting about the field that I'm in is when you first come into it as a junior engineer, if you don't really come from a technical background, you come from as an analyst, you kind of know how to do a bit of scripting and automation, but 
you know, it's, it's very daunting at first because you're being asked to create these solutions and it's not like operational work where there's a clear end to it, right? Engineering work, there's no end to it, it's knowledge work. That's why, you know, the salaries are really great. The job is really fun if you like to solve problems, but it can be a bit stressful if you, you know, get tasked with a solution that you don't necessarily know the answer to right away. So one piece of advice that I would give you guys is if you get into a field like this, a knowledge work field, and you know, you're feeling overwhelmed because you get a, a task your first week or you're scared to get into the field because you feel like you're gonna be overwhelmed. Just remember that although I really like to think that the solutions that I've created are really cool, chances are I'm not the first person to do it, right? Google is your friend. You're not gonna be the first person to create a solution. And if you are the first person to create that specific solution, I guarantee subsets of that solution would have already been created, whether it's from GitHub repos like CDK examples, or there's tons of repos. And I'll try to post some in the description below as to what you can kind of get your, um, what you can kind of base your solutions on. But you're not the first person to create these solutions. And if you are, good for you, you're gonna do great. But there's always going to be help and resources that you can use to create solutions like this, whether it's teammates. I've always worked in you know small teams, so I kind of had to use my own knowledge and a lot of Googling to get by. But I've also had really great mentors as well, especially in my last job and, and this job as well. Um, so you're not gonna be the first person to create that solution. And your team, if you're in a good team, and you'll know right away if you're not, but if you're in a good team, your team's not going to expect you to create comprehensive solutions day one when you come in as an entry level engineer. So if they do, I hate to break it to you, you're not in the right company, find a new job. But you can really rely on other people in this field, right? And another skill that you're gonna have to bring is basic knowledge of Python, you know, C++, Java, some sort of programming language. Obviously that's a prerequisite to getting into engin any engineering field in terms of co computer science or computer engineering, but you don't need to become a, an expert so much as you think, right? If you have great knowledge of not only the cloud and how it works in terms of APIs and resources and different you know, resources that you can use, learning a bit of Python and coming in with a base knowledge of Python and being able to create simple functions can go a long way in terms of interacting with you know, the AWS APIs, the AWS SDKs, and the AWS CDKs. I mean, you can use TypeScript, you can use Python, you can use Java, C++, Golang, any of these in languages. Now, the final skill I'd recommend you guys to have is just confidence. Have confidence that if you have put in the work, it's gonna pay off. Have confidence that you can ask questions if you don't know what you're talking about. Don't sit there and you know muddle over one thing the entire day. Ask a question. If you have a great team, like you should, they'll answer your question. It'll get solved a lot quicker if you just have a bit of confidence to say, hey, I don't know something because I guarantee no one knows everything in the engineering field. It's a huge field. You know, all too often in engineering fields, I see people trying to take on tasks that they don't really understand. And there's, it's, it's not, you know, so much of a competence thing. It's the fact that someone might have used that technology or tooling before you. So they should, you know, get tasked with that story or that task instead of you, right? So if you speak up and say, hey, I've never done this before, can I have a little bit of help? Maybe someone takes that off your plate and you get an, uh, another task sent to you that you actually have experience with. So never be afraid to you know, kind of speak up and use that confidence and actually um, collaborate with a team like it's supposed to be. So I hope you guys gained a little bit of more of an understanding of what I actually do as a cloud security engineer and you know what, kind of, what you can kind of expect if you go down this path. I think a lot of the issue in cybersecurity is the ambiguity in terms of Cybersecurity is such a huge field and no one really talks about what exactly it is in granular detail and what kind of specializations you can go to and what you should be focusing on in school or before you actually go and try to apply for those specific job roles in cybersecurity. You know, that's really the barrier I'm trying to break down. Uh, I think there's a lack of knowledge in terms of that. There's always a lot of, you know, show in terms of uh, cool tooling, bug bounty hunting and things like that. And that's great but we really have to get people in on the ground floor of cybersecurity and I learned the hard way. I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. I couldn't even tell people what I did when I went to college. And it, it, it really is a great feeling knowing what kind of niche role that you're meant to be in and what kind of niche role that you want to actually go in so you can study with a little bit of you know, ferocity into that specific role. Now, if you guys have any questions on anything I talked about or you just wanna learn more about what I do in general or any other jobs that I'm familiar with, Feel free to leave a comment down below, you know, DM me on Twitter, DM me on Discord, join the Discord and ask someone in there, but definitely ask a question if you're someone that's trying to really crack into this field.
As always, I really appreciate you guys for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next one.